Um, as Thomas mentioned, uh, we are in a series called Behold, in which we are looking at the story of Advent, the, the looking back at Jesus' first coming and looking forward to his second coming through the eyes of John the Baptist. And so we've spent the first couple of weeks, first one looking at the idea of prepare and the call that John the Baptist had to prepare, to make a way for the people so that people would understand who Jesus was. And he did that through sharing about repentance and forgiveness. Then last week we talked about this idea of witness and how John wasn't the light, but he was a witness to the light. And his whole job was to point people to who Jesus was. And we're going to continue this idea because if we can capture, if you and I can capture what we're going to take, uh, what we're going to learn about today and take hold of it. I truly believe, I I believe that this section, especially uh, one of the verses, this is one of my life verses that I love and want to live by and don't always uh, reach that. But it's one of those where this is such an important perspective that John the Baptist teaches us during the Advent season, but in any and every season of our lives. Now, before we jump into the passage itself, um, I recently saw this video that maybe some of you have seen it before, and it's a video where a guy is explaining the uh, different look on different faces of bronze medalists, silver medalists, and gold medalists in the Olympics. And they take the pictures of when they're standing on the medal stand, and you see the bronze medalist oftentimes is smiling and is really big. You look at the gold medalist, and obviously the gold medalist is smiling. They just won the gold medal. And then there's these pictures of the silver medalist. And what often happens is because when you're the silver medalist, usually how that works is that, you know, you might be in a, a one-on-one competition with the gold medalist, and you had just lost. You had just had that opportunity to seize the gold, and then you lose, and you get the silver. And instead of the perspective of, I am, or we are, if it's a team, the second best at this sport in the world, we look and we think, I just missed out on being the best. The third, me- the, the, someone who gets a bronze medal, they often are someone who won a bronze medal match. So again, they had, they're going on the, the podium on the medal stand having just won. So they're smiling. The gold medalists, they're smiling. The silver medal, it's not always, it's not, it's not perfect, but the, the whole illustration of this video is talking about how, what would it look like for us to be able to have the mindset that being second is still winning, it's still good, it's still something to celebrate, it's still something to rejoice in, because it means that you've worked so hard, it means that you've done well, and while you may not have achieved exactly everything you wanted, you are still universally known as being incredible at what you do. And what we're looking at this morning is the story of of John the Baptist and how he is able to rejoice, even though when we're going to see in the passage, it's going to look like, especially to his disciples, that he's second best at best, that he's a silver medalist in regards to the, the acclaim, the fame, the popularity of the people around him. And yet John holds this perspective that he knew his role. He played it well. And in so doing, if we can understand that as well, I think that that'll have an impact just in the Advent season as well as in every other season of our lives. What does it look like for us to have rejoice and to have our joy be made complete when we fix our eyes on the right things and refuse the wrong ones? Let's pray as we get ready for what God has for us this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person who's part of our service today, whether live in person, live online, watching or listening later. Lord, I thank you for the fact that each person who hears my voice is someone who is loved by you, created by you, formed by you. Lord, each person who hears my voice is someone, Jesus, that you died for, so that we may have a right relationship with God the Father through you. And Holy Spirit, each person who hears my voice is someone that you want to draw one step closer to God this morning. Whether that's very first step of faith, whether it's just seeking and wanting to learn more, or maybe it's just a step of closer intimacy with you. May we all fix our eyes upon you this morning. I pray that as we dive into it, that I would decrease, that you would increase, that you would speak in a personal, powerful, impactful way to each and every one of us. Lord, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to be in John chapter 3, starting in verse 22, if you want to turn your Bibles there. And we're, so far, what we've seen in this section, or in this series, is how John the Baptist is just so clear about his purpose, so clear about his role, so clear about what he's meant to do, and what he's not meant to do. 
We talked last week that John the Baptist knew who he was. He knew who he wasn't so that he could speak clearly about who Jesus is. For us, we may want to be the best. We we may want to elevate ourselves, but our job, our role in this world is to recognize that we are not the main characters of our own stories. We are not the main characters of the story of the world. We get to play our part of pointing people to Jesus. And some of us are in different areas in that or in different steps in that, but the idea is that when we recognize that our joy, what, that we try to seek in popularity and possessions and what people think of us in our productivity and how well we do in our grades and our salaries and our career, when we try to find our joy in any and all of those things that are transitory, that can change, that can ebb and flow, then that means that our joy can feel transitory. It can feel like it changes. It can feel like it ebbs and flows. So what does it look like for us to find joy True joy that is made complete in him who does not change, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as Hebrews 13 tells us, and to be able to fix our eyes on Jesus as the author and perfecter of our faith. So we're going to look at the first section here as we start the story. The first point that we're going to make today is the idea that our joy is complete when we focus not on who is following us, but on who we follow. Not on who is following us, not how much influence we have, not how much power we have, not the positional authority that we have, not in anyone looking to us, but instead recognizing it's not about who's following us, it's about who are we following. In John chapter 3, this, in the first 16 verses, is a story, or sorry, first 21 verses, is the story of Jesus talking to Nicodemus. This is the story where he's telling Nicodemus what it means to be born again. The, the idea that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The idea that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world but to save the world. And so we see this all the way through verse 21. And then here's where we pick up the story in verse 22. We have the reference on the screen, but the scripture is, won't be on there. So you can just follow along. Either the Bibles you brought, the Bibles in the seat pockets in front of you, the Bible tab if you're joining us online, or you can just listen. Verse 22 says this. After this, after the conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. Verse 24 gives us a parenthetical reference saying, this was before John was put in prison. We'll learn about that next week. Verse 25, an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, Look, or in some translations, behold, like our title of the series, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. In a season and in a, in a culture in which we want to get as many followers, we want to get as many people to, to listen to what we have to say, we want to have prestige and popularity, the people, and back then, John's disciples were of the same mindset. They said, John, you were, you were the one that everyone came to. You were the one that everyone would go out to be in order to be baptized. And I don't know if you're aware of this, John, but Jesus, the one that you had testified about, which last week this testimony was, behold, there is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. He was so clear about who, John was so clear about who he wasn't and about who he was so he could declare clearly about who Jesus is. And so, What we see here is that John's disciples, the ones who have still been devoted to him and then followed him, they're saying, I don't know if you're aware, but you're losing your popularity. I don't know if you're aware, but you know, your, your gatherings are much smaller than Jesus's. I don't know if you're aware, but people aren't listening to you as much. And what happens is, is that when someone that we follow starts to lose popularity, if we've attached our identity in anyone other than Jesus... When that person, their popularity and their impact starts to wane, we feel like our identity starts to lose as well. And so they're saying, John, we've, we've dedicated time following you, but you know, I don't know if you're aware, Jesus has more followers, more people are going to him, and what they're not saying, but what many of us might empathize with how they're feeling, is if, John, if you're not the one, and we've dedicated time with you, what does that make us? If our identity, if yours and mine can be latched onto anyone other than Jesus, 
that person's popularity can ebb and flow. It can wax and wane. And if we've attached our identity to them, then we would therefore think, well, then that means our value, our identity, our purpose may ebb and flow, wax and wane with those we follow. Now, a very, um, a very small and insignificant example would be when you have uh, different teams that you followed your whole lives. When they're doing well, you could feel, you know, uh, maybe you don't, I do. Like, I feel I'm like, okay, good. Like, our team's doing well. And you go on to, like, you hear about other uh, fans and, like, they want to trash talk, and you're like, you don't even need to say anything, right? Because you're just, like, scoreboard, and you just walk away, right? But just recognizing when, you're, when you aren't doing well, I'm like, when, when our te- my teams lose, I'm like, I don't want to, like, I don't want to hear trash talk from people. I don't want people to point out. Because why? Because if I'm not careful, I can be like, oh, I, I feel better about myself when my teams win. Now, that is shallow, and just because I have a mic taped to my face doesn't mean that I've got everything figured out, Right? But we can feel that whether it's about sports, whether it's about politics, whether it's about a favorite author or musician or actor or actress. I mean, we could find ourselves attached to people and then we could find our identity wax or waning when that person's popularity wanes. And so what does John tell us? It tells us that our true joy, complete joy can happen when we're not focusing on how many people are following us. What's our impact, our influence, our ability to to leave a mark? But are we following in step with Jesus? Because if we have all the influence in the world, and then we lead people astray, better for us to follow Jesus and have a minimal impact of followers, but we're following him closely. Far be it for us to lead the multitude astray because we're not following the only one who can give us our hope, who can give us peace, who can show us love, and who can provide for us complete joy. John the Baptist shows us that our joy can be complete. We focus less on our impact and how, focus more on how much Jesus is impacting us. Number two, we continue on verse 27, the beautiful, beautiful verse. But the point is this, right before we jump into it, is this. Our joy is complete when we are satisfied with what we have rather than what we don't. For those of you uh, who have kids or, or just someone who likes uh, getting gifts in the Christmas, I'm going to say it louder for those of you in the back. So our joy is complete when we are satisfied with what we have rather than finding this dissatisfaction in what we don't. It's recognizing that that is not where we get our value. It doesn't matter how long your wish list is. Because as much as we might have that momentary joy of opening the present, it can be momentary until we have the next longing for something else. Our satisfaction in temporary things is only as permanent. It's only as valuable as, as the fact of the next time we want something else, we feel a loss. We see this on Christmas morning when either you or kids or grandkids open up presents. They're so excited. And then all of a sudden, they want to go to the next present. And that present that you spent at least 12 seconds clicking buy now on Amazon, like at least <laughs> you spent all that time, but they're already looking to the next thing. How often do you and I think, God, thank you for showing up then how often do we just automatically want to look to the next thing we don't have? Verse 27, here's what John says. After his disciples are saying, I don't know if you know this, but that other one's getting more followers. Here's what John 3.27 says. To this John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. Oh, friends, if we can take hold of this, it would mean that we would stop yearning for things that are not meant for us to have. We would stop sweating and striving and having blood, sweat, and tears in order to to yearn for the approval of people that maybe we're not meant to get everyone's approval. That we wouldn't be yearning and striving for that raise that in turn would cause us to spend less time with our family and be a detriment to our home. That we wouldn't be yearning to get the newest, like whatever gadget or car or whatever it is so that people would say, oh, that person has it all together. Or this person really is is doing a good job. Look at how well they're doing financially or, or materially. Friends, we are only able to get what God has been given to us. And that goes for our gifts and our talents as well. 
that we may want to be people who are able to do different things or to maybe do bigger things that we think bigger is automatically better. And yet God has given to each of us the talents and the gifts and the abilities that he saw fit to give us. That 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about each person has been given gifts at the measure to which God has given them. So you may have an incredible gift that only you can do and only you can use in a way that only God has provided for you. But if you spend your whole life downplaying your gift because you want another one, that's like when someone gives you a gift or, or you've given a gift to someone. And maybe you spent more than 12 seconds. You really care about this. If you wanted to give it to someone and they toss it to the side because it's not what they wanted, but it's the gift that they've been given. Your time, your talents, your treasures, your abilities, whatever it is, we can only receive what is given from heaven. John says, John the Baptist says, listen, if those disciples are going to follow Jesus, That's what I want. I'm not here to take from Jesus the people that God has put here to follow Jesus. He said, I can only take what's been, or I can only receive what's been given. We often hear the idea that comparison is the thief of joy. If I were to say in here, which I don't, so to be clear, it's not going to happen. But if I were to give every, if I were to give this third of the, of the um, congregation if I were to give each of you $25 today, you'd be like, sweet, I got $25. I don't know, I'm going to buy one thing from a restaurant because they're so expensive, but I'm going to do it. It's going to be great. If I were to give everyone here $100, you'd be like, okay, I can buy three things at a restaurant. If I were to give everyone here $1,000, and no, I didn't just pick that because that's usually where I sit. It's, a, it's an illustration. <laughs> if I were to give everyone here $1,000, Yubi, that's amazing. What are you feeling right now? You're like, wait, why did they get a thousand? Instead of saying, well, I had 25 and I didn't deserve any of that either. Comparing ourselves to one another can rob us of the joy that God has for us. Because we don't get satisfied with what we have. We're not grateful for the blessings we've received. We want bigger, different, or greater blessings. And so if we're in a season where we're like, oh God, I'm just, I'm just grateful to be able to, like little things, like when you're sick and you can't breathe out of your nose, like I take this for granted. I just want to be able to breathe out of my nose. And then the moment it happens, it's like, ah. How often do you and I thank God that we can breathe through our noses? How often do we thank God that we can open up in this faithfulness of God that the sun is shining in the morning? And that God has brought us through another night. I mean, there's so many things. And what happens is, is if we lose sight of this idea, then we lose the importance of gratitude in our lives. And so instead of being people of gratitude, we are become people of grumbling of what we don't have. Tish Harrison Warren talks about this. She says, to choose joy is to see all existence as a gift which is why the presence of joy is inseparable from the practice of gratitude. Gratitude gives birth to joy because gratitude teaches us to receive life as a gift in the moment we're in, regardless of what lies ahead. Instead of looking back and regretting what we don't have, instead of looking forward and being frustrated and grumbling about what we haven't received that we want to have, What would it look like for us to live in the present and to thank God for what we do have? To actually receive the gift of today, of this moment, of the things in your life that we don't fully understand, but we don't need to fully understand to fully trust. What would it look like for us to be able to say, God, I don't know why you've given me some things that are hard, but I'll try to receive it with joy. And I don't know why you haven't given me things that I deem to be good. But I'm only going to receive what you give me so that I can experience the gratitude and the joy that comes from that. So we talk about how our joy is complete when we focus less on the people around, the, who's following us, but who are we following? 
that our joy is complete when we are satisfied with what we have. That we just say, like John in verse 27, I can only receive what God's given me. I can't strive or earn more than what he has deemed I am ready and what I am able to receive now. So instead of longing for what I wish I had and yearning for what I want to have, can I be grateful for what I do have? That'll help us to experience joy and gratitude. Number three, verse 20 and 29 will show us this. Our joy is complete when we remember we can't choose which role we play, but we can choose how well we play that role. I used this line last week when we're talking about the role that we have in life, that we are not the main characters, but it's worth reiterating because we can't choose the gifts that we have. We can't choose the life that we receive. We can't choose, like, we, we have this, this belief in, um, in our culture that we could be self-made men and women, that we could do this all on our own. And as my previous senior pastor in my previous church would say, he would retort that with, well, which part of you did you actually make? Because you didn't create your own brain. You didn't create your own body. You didn't give yourself those gifts. You didn't do all those things. So we are not self-made men or women. We are men and women that can choose to give back to God out of all the gifts he's given to us. We can give back to God a life well lived. Here's how John talks about this verse 20. I'm going to read the first part. We'll highlight it and we'll jump to another verse. We'll come back and forth. So let's, the next slide says this. This is John speaking to his disciples. He says, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. He, he, he's, again, he's so clear. John the Baptist is so clear about who he's not and about who he is, so he could clearly communicate about who Jesus is. He's so clear. He's like, I've told you, I am not the Messiah. I am not the one that the people of Israel have been looking forward to for thousands of years. I am not the one that people will flock to. I am not the one that is going to have this huge set of followers. I am not the one who is going to bring redemption for God's people. That's not me, nor has it ever been me. How many times do you and I live thinking that we are the ones that need to solve everything? We are the ones that people are going to turn to. We are the ones that need to have it all together. And we are the ones that people are going to flock to. When your story and my story and John the Baptist's story was never about us. It has been, still is, and always will be about Jesus. We don't get to pick which role we play but we can choose how well we play our role. This idea of the bride belongs to the bridegroom. John, we'll we'll, we'll unpack this in a moment a little bit more deeply, but this idea that John the Baptist is putting himself as the best man in in Jesus' wedding, if you will. And he says the bride, God's people, was never meant for the best man. That's always been meant for the bride. So, why would John be upset that the people of God, the bride of Christ, would be going after Christ? He says, no, this is not my role. In fact, we see this language in Isaiah 62, verse 5, this similar verbiage about, from the Old Testament prophecy about how God would be as a husband to his people. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. It's saying that all the way back from the Old Testament, these prophecies were pointing to God as a groom and his people as the bride. That's, that's why stories like Hosea are really difficult because Hosea was a prophet who married a prostitute, Gomer, and the way in which Gomer cheated on Hosea was supposed to paint the picture of how Israel had cheated on God as the bridegroom. I mean, this is, this is really heavy, but it's important for us to figure out and to take hold of. That God sees his people as his bride and he's the groom. And John the Baptist has no question about who's supposed to take the bride. It's not about him getting followers. It's not about him having the bride. It's about him pointing the bride and connecting the bride and the bridegroom together. Let's continue the next part of John 3, 28 and 29. It says, the bridegroom belongs to the... Or the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. This is where we're getting this verbiage of the joy can be made complete because we're learning lessons from John the Baptist. But this idea here 
that the friend who attends the bridegroom, now John is this best man, and he waits and he listens for the voice of the bridegroom and is full of joy when he hears it. And that joy is mine and is now complete. Let's take a moment to, to step back and look at some of the dynamics of a um, ancient Near East wedding around this time. I, I got this from uh, one of the commentators I looked at. Let's go to the next slide. Um, from Gerald L. Borchardt. It says this, At that time in history, the bridegroom normally selected one or two close friends to escort the bride to the bridegroom's marriage chamber and to wait outside the room or tent for the bridegroom's shouts and often for receipt of tokens that the marriage had been consummated with his virgin bride. That's a lot to unpack, so we're going to take just a moment here. So the role of the, the best man, a couple of friends from the bridegroom, was to organize the wedding, it was to bring the, the bride to the marriage chamber where the groom would be waiting. It was to make sure that he, he would wait on the outside. And when the groom made, like, was, uh, expressed a voice of saying that the marriage had been consummated, that then that bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, excuse me, would be filled with joy because he knew that this was a cause for celebration. That everything in the marriage was, was uh, everything with the wedding planning and everything was good. And so then he goes and he would, ex- they would he receive the tokens and then he would go to the, the marriage celebration that would last seven days. And the people in the, in the, in the village or in the area would celebrate. Why am I going into this? Because it points us to the role that John the Baptist gives himself. He is someone that his job as the, bri- the friend of the bridegroom, as the best man, would be to help bring the bride to where the groom would be waiting, to prepare a way to make sure the bride would come to the groom, to be able to wait. And when the voice was saying, yes, the bridegroom has received the bride and they are married And we'll live happily ever after the best man. He gets to celebrate. He celebrates that things have gone well. And he celebrates that his role has come to fruition. The best man doesn't hang out at their house all the time. The best man doesn't crash on the couch when things are hard. Like, the best man, after that role is completed, fades to the background of the marriage ceremony and fades to the background of the married couple. John the Baptist is saying this. He says, my job is to bring the Messiah, the groom, and the people, the bride, and bring the bride to the groom. And when I hear the voice, the voice of the groom saying that I receive my bride, that my joy is complete. He was never meant to take the bride. He was never meant to get the popularity. He was never meant to be the main focus. He was never meant to be the light. He was never meant to be the main character. He says, I've done my job. I've done it well. My joy is complete. It is fulfilled. John Piper, he talks about this passage a little bit. And he says this. In verse 28, John, I know John Piper is talking about the Gospel of John, written by John the Apostle, talking about John the Baptist. My first name is John. I get it. Like, there's a lot going on here. So John Piper is talking about John the Baptist. So John the Baptist tells his disciples that this is no surprise that the people were going to Jesus instead. It was no surprise because God sent him for this very thing, that people would turn away from him and go to Christ. Verse 28 says, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. God sent him for this. This was God's plan. Gather people and then give them up. Rise like a star in the wilderness and then burn out like a meteorite. That's the plan. John knows it. And as it happens, his joy increases. I've had the honor to be a, a best man a couple times. I've had the honor of officiating dozens of weddings. And I can say, like, especially when I'm doing a wedding, I'm officiating. I'm, I, I'm so aware of wanting to make sure that, you know, I, I have the words right. I want to make sure that I say the names right. I don't want to pull, like, a Friends episode and, you know, say the wrong name. Like, I want to make sure I do well. So when, like, there's that moment when I say, you may now kiss the bride, and I step out of the way, because that's what wedding photographers tell me to do, and then they take a picture of the kiss, and they walk down the aisle, I'm like, I did my job. I did my role, and I can just feel like the rest of the day, I'm like, 
I just get to, you know, pick at the hors d'oeuvres for the rest of the day and not worry about it because my role has been completed. My joy in that regard has been complete and fulfilled. And John the Baptist, what would it look like to have such clarity of your role in life? To not strive after what was never meant for you. To not yearn and stress and be anxious about what God may never have had in store for you. If I, looking, I'm five, eight on a good day, like, and if I were to think, well, my job, my, my purpose was to play center in the NBA, I will never be seven feet tall. I will never be six foot nine, even in today's NBA where you could be smaller. If I thought my purpose was to be a center in playing football, I will never be, Lord willing, 300 or 400 pounds, right? Like, there are some things that I can never do. If I spent my whole life frustrated that God didn't make me six foot nine in order to play the NBA, I would be missing out on what God had created me to do. And so if you and I, if we are so frustrated about the part that we wanted to play that God did not seem to give us, that we reject the gift that he's, re- he's given to us, and we reject the life that he's given to us, then of course we're not going to experience joy. Of course we're going to try to find it in the next thing that we buy, or the amount of followers we have, or the job title that we receive, or the, the, the salary that we make, or the grades that we get. I mean, of course, because we all want to latch on to find our identity in something bigger than ourselves, but anything other than Christ to which we latch on our identity is, has, runs the, has run the risk of ebbing and flowing, of waxing and waning. I don't know about you, but man, wouldn't it be great to be so clear in our purpose to be able to finish a job and say, I've, I've done my job well. That humility is, as we heard C.S. Lewis and we hear this quote, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's not like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not really that good at things. If someone gave you a gift, like, oh, I don't really like the gift. It's not that great. The giver would be like, hold up. I gave you that gift. Don't besmirch me. If we look at the things that God has given us, like, oh, I'm not, I'm not really good at that. He'd be like, hold up. I gave you those gifts. Don't besmirch me. Use those gifts and say, I, I've done what I can do, and I've let go of what I couldn't do, and I give it all to God. We do that, we can hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Come enter into your master's happiness. Come enter into your master's joy. Fourth point. This is the one that I love. I love them all. You know. Our joy is complete when we realize we must decrease so Jesus can increase. If you've been with us for any amount of time, if this is your very first time with us, you may not have caught it, or even if you did, may not have registered. If, if you've been with, with us any longer amount of time than today, you know that part of my prayer every time I preach is that as we dive into God's word, that I would decrease and that God would increase. That God would speak to us in a personal, powerful, and impactful way. That this idea of us or me decreasing and God increasing in my life is the, is the life verse that I want to, again, I don't fulfill this perfectly, but that's the desire that when someone who's mean to me says something or attacks me, my hope is that it's more of Jesus's response to him than my own. When I don't get the things that I want, I would want that to be more of Jesus increasing in me so I can live like John the Baptist than how my own nature wants to respond. I would want to be able to say that it's more of God in my life and less of myself. John 3.30, he must increase, I must decrease. That's how this section, or he must become greater, I must become less. That's the NIV. He must become greater, I must become less. And having that be the call of our lives in our marriages, as parents, as grandparents, as employees, employers, neighbors, friends. It'd be more about what Jesus is doing in us and he's increasing. The volume of his voice is being magnified in our lives and and the volume of our own voice is decreasing. It's being lowered. 
I don't know how many of you, how many, quick show of hands, just will help me to know how much I need to explain. Um, how many of you have seen uh, Hamilton, the American musical? Excellent. Um, I, uh, I love Hamilton, um, and it's so well written, uh, and it's just, just a great story. Um, not all per- purely historically accurate, but, um, you know, it's, it's still good. So there's a section uh, in... Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite songs, if not my favorite song, called One Last Time. You guys know what song I'm talking about. If you've watched the, watched the, the play, whether from Disney+, Plus or maybe you've had an opportunity to see it live, it's the story starts off in which Hamilton has already, you know, creates a rivalry with Thomas Jefferson. Uh, George Washington is telling Hamilton, he's like, you know, Thomas Jefferson quit. And Hamilton's like, great, I can finally like write all these bad things about him. You know, he's like, I'll write under a pseudonym. You can see what I will do to him. Anyways, I'm not going to do the whole thing. Um, but just recognize that he's able to fight. He's like, okay, good. Like, now we can say everything I've wanted to say. And Washington is like, well, no, he's stepping down so he could run the president or run for president. And then Hamilton's like, well, good luck defeating you, sir. And he's like, I'm stepping down because I'm not running for president. And Hamilton's like, sorry, what? <laughs> like, so... It's this transition that happens when Washington is trying to say, I don't want to be president forever. I want to sit under my vine and fig tree. I want to enjoy this nation that we've made. I want to be able to step back from this role in leadership. And I want to show people what a peaceful transfer of power can look like. And so he's doing this. And in the song, Hamilton's trying to talk back and say, no, no, no. And and then um, Washington gives him a quill and then this next section, we're going to see the first part of it here. We're just going to look at the pictures. It's Hamilton. He's writing because he, was, he would write um, uh, Washington's speech. He starts writing the farewell address. And so he starts to talk and to say these lines. And as he's holding the quill, he's saying word for word or very closely word for word what it was that Washington's farewell address was going to be. And he's, he's the pen man. He's, he's the one that's writing it. The next picture shows us how... Then they take a faraway shot, and Hamilton is still at the front. But you start to see the light on the back um, for George Washington as he starts to go downstage, or he's upstage, and Hamilton's downstage. The light shines. Then as Hamilton is still writing the lyrics, and as he's saying them, he starts walking backwards. And as Washington, he starts to hear, and he starts to sing along. And Christopher Jackson, who plays uh, Washington, has the voice of perfection like it's just beautiful his voice and so he's singing as Hamilton is saying and then they have this moment in this next slide where they're standing next to each other and then there's a a close-up version as the next one where all of a sudden it's the one who was up front is decreasing and Washington is coming forward and they're singing together saying the lines together the next one shows Hamilton has this moment of he turns and he starts to step back And as he turns and starts to step back, he goes back to the back of the stage and George Washington steps forward. And again, they're still talking at the same time. Hamilton's still talking. Washington is singing, but this transition is taking place. The next picture shows us that Washington is all by himself lit on the stage now. And he's able to sing this beautiful, beautiful part of the farewell address. And Hamilton's still on the side. He's still saying a couple of the lines here or there. But this is Washington's moment to shine. And then this last picture shows us when he's singing, and then you see Hamilton is moving, he's with his wife, and his, his son's right behind there. But it's this moment where Hamilton's not, he, he's sad that Washington isn't in charge anymore, but he's singing to celebrate the one who needed to increase in this song. That Hamilton... Uh, well, Lin-Manuel Miranda, he talks about how he wrote that song and he's like, I'm just going to let Christopher Jackson just go because his voice is so great. And so there's this picture that takes place. John the Baptist, he came first. But he declared in his testimony that the one who comes after me surpasses me because he was before me. He come and he starts to say, repent for the kingdom of God is near. He says, I'm just one who is a voice in the wilderness saying, make way for the Lord. He says, I'm not the Messiah. He is so clear about who he's not. He's so clear about who he is. So he could declare clearly about who Jesus is. And then in this section in John chapter 3, we see that John the Baptist, he starts to decrease. His impact is less. His followers 
are fewer. His voice is getting quieter. His disciples are questioning it all. And he just says, this was why I came. I came to rise like a star and to burn out like a meteorite. I came so that Jesus, the one who coming after me, he's always meant to surpass me. He's the groom. He's the bridegroom. My job is to bring him to the chamber of the bride. I get to celebrate. And my joy is made complete when it's less about me and it's more about Christ. It's less about what I want. It's less about the things that I yearn for. It's less about the things I'm anxious about. It's less about the popularity of those around me or how I'm impacting people. It's less about any of these things. And it's all about Jesus. And in the movie, in the play, like, I get, those of you who've watched the play, you're like, you're trying to make Alexander Hamilton look like he's someone that wants to decrease. And I get that there's a conflict there because he's not going to throw away his shot. Or will he? Spoiler. Um, but... But the picture of him stepping back and Jesus stepping forward and then Hamilton ending singing in celebration of the one who steps forward is a picture for us to take hold of of what it means to decrease so that Jesus can increase. Augustine says it this way when he talks about the need for us to decrease. He says, should you ask me, what is the first thing in religion? I should reply, the first, second, And third thing therein is humility. It's being humble enough to receive what God has given. It's being humble enough to know that we don't get to choose the part we play, but we get to play how well we choose how well we play that part. It's not about who's following us; it's about who we're following. And then to have the humility to say, "I want less of me, and I want more of God in my life, more of His impact." more of the fruit of his spirit, of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Less of the fruits, less of the the, the fleshly nature that I have, more of God's fruit. And so I remember hearing this, and I'll close with this. Uh, I remember early on in my faith listening to Air One uh, radio station, and they would have like Luis Palau would come on and he would like share like one minute of wisdom. And they still do this like on other uh, stations um, as well. But he talked about joy, and he talked about it this way. So I'll I'll take his lines uh, and apply it to our passage today. That our joy is complete when we order our priorities with Jesus first, and others next, and then yourself. It doesn't mean that we don't love ourselves. Why? Because we're supposed to love others as we love ourselves. This is not, again, thinking less of ourselves, but it's thinking of ourselves less often. It's recognizing if we put Jesus first and he increases in our lives, then we could put others next. That in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3, it talks about, Paul writes, this is how you can make the joy complete. That you should do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others greater than yourselves. And so this idea of complete joy or joy being made complete ties in from John 3 all the way to Philippians 2. And it's showing us that if we put Jesus first, that he would increase, that we would decrease, that we would step back as he steps forward in our lives. And then we put others' needs above our own. And then we put ourselves last, not because we don't love ourselves, but because we follow Jesus' footsteps, who being in the very nature of God, do not consider equality with God something to be taken advantage of. But he became a servant. He humbled himself and became a servant. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself even to death, death on a cross. And so he came from the riches of heaven to the rags of a manger that we remember in Christmas. And while he did that, he didn't take advantage, but he put others above himself. And we ought to have the same attitude as him, the same mindset as Christ. Not the one that wants to go from the bottom and take from heaven, but the one who receives what has been given to us from heaven, receives that gift, lives in such a way to put Jesus first, then others, then yourself last, and in so doing, receive the joy that we need not just in the Advent season, but in each and every season. The kind of joy we find when we know our part, we play it well, and we ask God to increase so that we could decrease.
countercultural. It is. But it's exactly the kind of life that God calls us to. And if we're tired of trying to latch onto various ways to find momentary bursts of joy, and we're struggling to say, what does it look like to experience true joy? A complete joy? It's looking at John the Baptist as the bridegroom's best friend who's rejoicing that the groom is coming together with the bride. And then his role has been well done. Here's well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in your master's joy. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person who's part of our service today, whether they're live in person, live online, watching or listening later throughout the week. Lord, I thank you for um, the example of John the Baptist, and, and I pray, I confess the times when I put my own wants above yours, or I grumble instead of I'm grateful, I um, do things that would not be what you would want, and I know I'm not the only one that struggles with these things. And so, Lord Jesus, would you, would you increase in my life, in all of our lives. And may we point people to you in this Advent season and in every other season. And may we live with the joy that only comes from finding our identity and our hope in you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.